Robbie, the people are clamoring to know what is on your radar today. Well, happy to fill you and the people <laughs> in. So the day before Thanksgiving, Dr. Anthony Fauci testified in a court case that's Schmidt v. Biden. This is the lawsuit brought by the Republican Attorneys General of Missouri and Louisiana against the Biden administration for allegedly pressuring social media companies to moderate so-called COVID-19 misinformation. The suit is being handled by the New Civil Liberties Alliance, a legal group making the case that dictates from the Biden White House, the CDC, and other top federal officials was so heavy-handed as to effectively violate the First Amendment. Clients of the New Civil Liberties Alliance include social media users who were kicked off the sites, they argue, because the federal government made it untenable for Twitter and Facebook and Google to avoid taking stronger stances against COVID misinformation, even though the science subsequently changed and many seemingly provocative claims about masks, vaccines, the origins of the virus itself are now legitimately debatable topics. You aren't a crazy conspiracy theorist if you don't think vaccines are meaningfully reducing cases or if you think COVID originated from a lab leak. We're allowed to discuss those things. Now, as part of this lawsuit, Fauci was deposed and had to answer questions for seven straight hours, actually. The deposition took place behind closed doors, so only the attorneys who were present and a few others got to hear what he had to say. But just yesterday, a transcript was released of the proceedings, and so we can finally read what Fauci was asked and what he answered. I want to highlight one exchange in particular. Fauci is asked about an email he sent to Hugh Oshenskloss, one of his top deputies. This email, sent shortly after midnight on February 1st, uh, contains an attachment. Quote, SARS, Barrick, She, et al., Nature Medicine. That's the name of the attachment. So undoubtedly, that attachment is referencing a 2015 article in Nature Medicine authored by those two people, Ralph Barrick and Shi Zhang Li Li. Barrick, you'll recall, is a professor of epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill who does research on coronaviruses. And Shi Zheng Li is a Wuhan researcher known as the Bat Lady for collecting so many bat samples at that lab under conditions that have prompted considerable public concern. We heard about some of them in that great ProPublica piece from a few uh, weeks ago. Now, their article discusses their successful efforts to mutate a bat-derived SARS-like virus in a manner that would make it infectious for humans. Work by Barrick and by Xi has been funded by the U.S. government vis-a-vis -vis the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, which is headed by Dr. Fauci. So in the deposition, Fauci is asked the following. Do you know why you attached that article to this email to Hugh, your principal deputy? Fauci responds, I'm quoting, I don't recall, but I believe, and again, I would say I don't precisely recall, but there was some recollection or someone told you that, you know, we do fund research in China, particularly surveillance research. I think you referred to it when you gave me one of the exhibits about the surveillance of what might be out in the community among bats. At my recollection, I brought to Hugh's attention saying, look, we have to speak in the morning because I want to find out what the scope of what it is that we are funding so I'll know about what we're talking about. And that's what I was referring to when I said, you'll have some tasks today to give me some information because this was the first, I had heard about specifics of what EcoHealth and other people were doing, and I wanted my staff to say, get me up to date. So that's what I meant by you have work to do. Next, Fauci was asked, were you concerned at the time that the work that you had funded in China might have led to the creation of the coronavirus? He answered, I wasn't concerned that it might have, but I didn't like the fact that I was completely in the dark about the totality of the work that was being done. And I was going into a phone call with a larger group of established scientists, and I wanted to have at my fingertips just what we were and were not doing. Fauci and the attorneys also discussed at great length the pause on U.S. funding for gain-of-function research that had gone into effect in 2014, though they note and forced Fauci to concede that the pause contained an exception clause whereby a U.S.-funded gain-of-function experiment could proceed if it was deemed necessary by a relevant agency head. So much for the pause. Here's Fauci summarizing this, quote, an exception from the pause may be obtained if the head of a U.S. government funding agency determines that the research is urgently needed to protect the public health or national security. So at the time that the pause on all of this research was implemented, it was felt strongly by just about everybody in the research community and the public health community that if you paused everything, well, there might be a situation where you would want to do an experiment that would be urgently necessary to protect the public health and national security, and therefore, that would allow an exception to be considered. The attorneys then asked the obvious follow-up question, which is, was such an exception ever granted? Fauci replies that such an exception was granted at least a few times. He is then asked whether he ever personally signed off on an exception. 
He says he doesn't recall, though it's possible such papers crossed his desk. And I would encourage everyone to read through that entire transcript if they want. It's tons and tons of pages, seven hours. And mostly it's Fauci saying he doesn't recall the specifics of what they're asking him. Uh, I, I wouldn't describe it as so, as so revealing, blows the lid off this whole thing. But look, I found it pretty interesting uh, to, to see more verification from him, from Fauci admitting that um, he looked into this when it was brought, when it was put forth to him that, hey, people are concerned that this derives from research we were doing and we can point to grants that were given to experiments that seem pretty much aimed at just this, and it's have, uh, given where the, the virus emerged from, given all these things, it looks awful uh, uh, convenient for, or, or inconvenient for, for what our responsibility would then be. And then also he does say that, ex I thought that pause was pretty, um, that pause of gain of function research was pretty absolute. Doesn't sound absolute at all. Oh, national security reasons? That's, <laughs> we know that's BS. And if national security uh, rationale can, can justify any government policy is what we've, is what we've come to find. So, I come away with it, not certainly not at peace about what we were doing. Yeah, look, the line about you know where he's asked whether or not he had concerns that motivated him to share the um, paper by Lee and and others, and he says, well, I didn't have concerns, but I didn't want to be in the dark. I didn't. I was uncomfortable being in the dark about what had been done and what hadn't been done. I mean, that's called concerns. Yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah. <laughs> That's what that means, you know, not liking being in the dark, thinking that there might be implications for one's agency's involvement in a bad outcome is like the definition of concerns. I understand why he doesn't want to necessarily give that sound bite because it might overstate the mm -hmm. extent of his concerns and how likely or like how, how likely he thought there was actually some um, responsibility there. But okay, that's that's legalese, that's lawyer speak, fine. Um, you know, I don't know how much of a smoking gun ultimately this is. I, I do think that Spouchy does seem to have been taking this position, especially as he's moving into retirement, about being open to gain of function research being the cause of the virus and lab leak being the cause of the virus. We talked about this, I think, a couple of weeks ago, that he that his language has been very accommodating to that extent, and it's not clear why or if that really does represent a shift from what he's been seeing before, but it will be been saying before, rather. But it will be interesting to see, you know, how much that tone mm -hmm. of conversation continues as he's no longer in his official capacity. And I have to say very frankly that, look, I get it's a, it's a very large uh, agency, federal health apparatus that he was in charge of for decades. So when he says, you know, I've been at this for so long, I don't remember what papers I read, whatever. Sure. I do get that, but this is very, this is very um, important research. Some would say dangerous. There's a lot of concerns about it. So for him to have even though I know he's got a lot, million things on his plate, for him to have really no idea, I mean, he needed to be brought up to speed when the coronavirus happened on what kind of research was being done and which projects had been granted. Maybe that's because there's so many of them, it would be unreasonable to expect him to know exactly what's going on. But this is a pretty big one, given the public concern about it. And, and he, like, he doesn't know if he granted an exception to continue doing this kind of experiment. If it came across his desk, he might have signed it because he just signs things without looking at it. Like, I don't know. It's... And well, he's an yeah. older man. It's harder to remember. I, I mean, well, we look, talk I, about I people it, staying in their jobs forever, but... I, I do think it's possible not to remember something like that until an yeah. emergency erupts. There are a lot of different ethical considerations that are happening in scientific research all over the place. It's not clear to me that he would have necessarily been tracking that one in particular. Then maybe you might think it's negligent to not have a closer eye on, on these kinds of things now knowing what COVID has wrought. But pre-COVID, yeah. you know, I don't think that's completely unreasonable, but I do think... I think he was prepped before going into this deposition and has probably taken a look at these documents in the past. And at this point, probably has a pretty decent recollection of why it is that he was circulating that paper that was so on point. And you know, again, we'll see how transparent he is going forward now that he is no longer in his official capacity or whether or not um, he starts closing up again when people start digging into more of these kinds of facts, admissions and deposition transcripts. Just reporting it, we report it, you decide. I think that's the, uh, <laughs> the old, the old timey journalism phrase. Uh, more rising right after this, stay with us.